Okay, this is from uh, Jeffrey Fox. He says, I was curious how to adjust the pitch of a Harley WL horn. I press my button, but I keep having to tap the horn to make a sound. They're, the way they work, I have to get a piece of paper. <laughs> right. So you've got power in, power out. It works like, so that's positive. And that goes in, comes across, and then it goes into a coil of wires, and then out to earth. Yeah? Okay. So that's power going all the way through that coil of wires, and that goes to earth. That's your horn button. Okay. Okay? So when you earth that, that powers up that coil of wire. It's called an electromagnet, and the slug of metal that fits down inside gets drawn downwards yeah but there's something coming off of that slug of metal your horn, the actual horn vibration ring is there now there's a set of points there off of that live wire to there yeah so when you hit that earth button this pulls down there's a screw coming through there which is that screw there all horns will have an adjuster screw on the back yeah as that comes down on the electromagnet it hits those points shuts out the power plunger goes back up yeah yeah you still got power on the points are con contacted then pulls it back down so that's your zzz, that's your horn vibration okay that's what makes the horn work so on all horns there's a screw like this somewhere on all old horns i should say and that lets you adjust the distance that that piece in the middle plunges in and out yeah and that sets the points so it'll vibrate yeah that's basically how they work so if you have a look on the back of it i think the highs have got a lock nut on them a little lock nut and then a little screw just undo the lock nut hold your finger on the horn button and screw that in and out and you'll make it work well, you can strip the whole thing down and clean the points and everything but generally if you're getting a a noise out of them just adjusting that screw they'll work okay uh, this is Rick from Rick Rose how many hours a day does Ash work from six in the morning till two oh, so just five days a week mm. you're only down here five days <laughs> no <laughs> no no normally seven days a week but seven days generally week. six and I come in on a Sunday morning normally and tidy up so I can't face it on Monday morning otherwise what's what's the earliest you started work in a day about half three in the morning I know I remember coming down one time and you said I'm tired I said what time did you start he went three or something <laughs> what the hell well sometimes you've got to reach deadlines haven't you so I'm an early bird I don't I don't do late uh, Charles Wiley what book are you referring to in this video uh, with the exploded view of the gearbox components yeah I would say so you got it's TM9 dash 1879 that will get you in any of your Harley shops or you know websites just quote that number and that will give you that book I'm guessing we're talking about this diagram because this one tells you like AP you look up AP main shaft end space washer outside diameter 15 16 times 78 thou thick to 113 thou thick that's your first and second gear spacer washer that's probably your best one for referencing yeah if you like um, your parts book shows you again the same picture like that but it doesn't reference all of these sizes it just gives you a part number oh okay which is basically the same picture just the other way up see that's the same picture all the same parts but it doesn't give you any reference to the sizes of what you can refer to when you're measuring up your gearbox parts yeah but that book does you know if you if you're rebuilding one you you really shouldn't need much more information than that apart from bruce palmer books very good for what should be parkerized cadmium plated you know if you're going to an nth degree restoration but if you want mechanical restoration they're, they're your books this is some simon beverage um, parts for the WLA are getting harder to find here in Australia. 
where do you source your bits and pieces? Um, you got if you want most of what you'll get now is reproduction. You do get some new old stock. Um, so you got Jan Willem Boon in the Netherlands. Yeah. You got forty five Flathead Service in the Netherlands. War Department in that's an English website. They have a lot of old new old stock stuff but it is seriously seriously expensive yeah. mm -hmm. um, basically any of those three and if you want to source from America if it's easier there are quite a few companies out there but generally those guys in Holland because they they were called the Liberator in Holland they, they bang into them you know so they, they hold a lot of stock of yeah. stuff um, so generally they're the main three I mean if you want to go like get original mud guards, um, an original oil filter, you know, absolutely, definitely, one hundred percent wartime. Then war department in England, but they're seriously expensive. Okay, so you could rebuild. You could go to forty five, for example, and completely rebuild a bike from parts you yeah. get from there. There'd be new old stock parts. Uh, oh, no, re sorry, reproduction. Parts. Reproduction parts, yes. I mean, I do reproduction frames in America now. Um, yeah, you could build a bike. I, I, I well, I'm saying that I, I'm, I don't know if they reproduce engine casings, um, but obviously your barrels and that you can get, yeah. your heads you can get. Um, I'm not sure about engine casings. You can buy all the bits for the crankshafts, everything. Yeah, so you, you could nigh on build a whole bike. Yeah. yeah. For some Gary Diggins. Yeah, I went to school with Gary. He said, they're still playing with cars, I see. Ashton, do you remember when you took your TVR to bits back in the late 80s and early 90s? Did you ever get around to putting it back together again? I think early 90s, 80s is probably that one. I don't think I finished that one until later. That's, that's TVR Vixen S2. So you, did you finish the one Gary's referring to? I it? think it's that one. It must be that one. Yeah, it's got to be that one. But that one had been in my dad's garage for since 1980, I think. So that one I finished later on. It probably was that one. It's nice you got a picture off of it. Yeah, I've got quite a few pictures of old cars and stuff. I've got some of me in there when I'm about 18. Bloody horrendous. <laughs> this is from Thomas Lang. Uh, Michael Fixman's Blue Harley. She says, that colour's beautiful. Any chance you know the name of the colour? Yes, I do, because it was it, sh it was the wrong colour for that year. I think they only did grey in... What year was it? 42? Or was it 41? Because it wasn't a WLA, it was a WL, wasn't it? Genuine um, civilian one. 45, was it? This, this one here. Ah, oh, right. What's right, that? that's right. It's in 1945. The only colour they did was grey. So that was the only colour option they offered in 1945, and I think it was a 46 colour. Colours for 46. Right, grey from the first order issue. Skyway blue. Police silver. Right, it's called Skyway blue. And that would be that blue, it wouldn't be a custom colour that he's No, had. I don't believe so. I think it was a genuine Harley colour from what he was saying. Because yeah. he was saying to me it should be grey, because in 1945 they only did grey. Okay. So yeah, Skyway blue. Didn't think you were going to know that. I know everything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> this is from uh, Robert McGough. Uh, he says, I was watching another programme. <laughs> The mechanic said that there was no timing mark on the motor. He said that he thought they had installed two right-hand flywheels, claiming that it gave you more horsepower. Have you ever heard of that? The bike was a 49 pan head. I know you can, on the pans and, and um, shovel heads, you can mix up the flywheels. Yeah, you can do that. They put in here again, it's got all your flywheel sizes and what they're matched to, but yes, I have heard of that. Oh. Um, but I mean when you time it up and that will give you more horsepower well if you lighten your flywheels inherently it'll accelerate faster you won't get as much engine braking but it will accelerate faster and, and, and any reciprocating mass in an engine if you want to tune it the lighter you get it the faster it'll pick up and the faster it'll rev 
Um, but you can time it up easily, you don't have to have a timing mark on it, you just take the front cylinder head off and measure down, you go, turn your engine over till it's firing on that stroke, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then you can never wind it back and do it, you always have to do it forward. So say you want it to fire at 9 sixteenths before top dead centre, yeah. which instead of on a degree wheel, you can do it by a measurement. Mm -hmm. So you set your vernier up at 9 sixteenths, wind it over on the compression stroke till the piston just touches your marker, then set your points to open. Okay. Uh, this is from Robert uh, August. There's a couple of questions from him. Um, he says, you addressed everything except what I've experienced. Mine developed an extreme leak at the third gear thrust bearing slash roller bearing insert. I haven't been able to find anyone that can address ways to fix this without replacing the insert. I just slathed it with uh, penetrating Loctite and Permatex right stuff. Uh -huh. It isn't leaking, just sitting there as it did, but I have my doubts about why, while riding it. We'll see shortly. If you could address this problem, it would be appreciated. I would say either the casing's cracked or something's been so out of line, it's just mashed itself, you know, it's just vibrated so much it's opened the casing out because it's this. Yeah, I mean, that's that's your insert, your roller bearing insert. For one of them to be leaking, I would suggest there's casing damage. Right. Possibly a crack in it somewhere that you might not be able to see it. Because if it's that loose, it's coming out of there, you ain't got a lot of hope, really. If it isn't cracked, you'd say it had been wobbling around. Yeah or vibrating badly so perhaps a bent main shaft or, or something like that because I mean to get one of them to leak it's got to be pretty damaged yeah. really because they're a nice tight fit you know if you've got a hydraulic press all, all good and well um, it comes out through the case in that way so that's your wide area there and that's your narrow area there so if you've got a hydraulic press brilliant just put it up so none of your studs or anything are hitting underneath on two level blocks. Get a painter's blow, plumber's blowtorch, heat the casing up, and just put something flat on it, and it will just tap out. Yeah. Then, I mean, they're a press fit, and when you fit it again, put that in the freezer, heat your casing, and it will just drop in. And then when it all contracts, it will just tighten up. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing painful about it. You have to take that off. Your second gear retainer um, bracket inside and then that will literally just heat it up you know, like I say if you've got a press all, all, all good and well if not get it nice and warm and it will just tap out and then like I say put it in leave it in the freezer overnight heat your casing up and it will probably just drop straight in here's some DD corpse and this is when you're doing sheet metal fabrication Yep. See, I'm totally new to this stuff. Where do I find someone who does this stuff and who can give me a, who can help me with a job? So I think the question really is, how do you get into this? Um, Where did you start? I went to college. But to study what? To do panel work yeah. and motor engineering. Um, I got what they could call work experience placement at Riverside Autos where that's there, oh, right, yeah. and they just said it's not worth you going back to college, just stay here. So I did. So you kind of serve an apprenticeship somewhere? Yeah, basically, like, they um, teach you. I mean, I went back and did all the exams, I passed them all, um, but it's just, it's a hands-on thing. If you're not doing it, you won't just pick it up and do it. You, you've got to... It's not textbook work, is it? No. It's practical. No, it's practical, yeah. I mean, metal's almost a living thing. When you hit it with hammer, it does all sorts of strange stuff, you know, but... Yeah, it's, it is just practice, to be fair. Kimo, 90808. Um, going through a mate's gearbox, once the tripper bolts that were replaced were tightened down, yep. they would not engage the starter slash kick gear to pull off the cluster gear. Right. In fact, the entire counter shaft would get stuck. Kick lever would not return to upright. Can't find any info in any manual I've seen. What I did, well, what I had to do was loosen them from the outside, which hoping the tripper ends didn't spin, yeah. and basically loosen them up a bit. After I got it working constantly or consistently, tightening up a yeah, little yeah, at yeah. a time, but it all 
but all got sorted. But I'm now worried they might come loose inside. Outside yes. has been staked, just feeling a bit dodgy about it. What do you think? Depends how tight you got them, but what they are, the tripper bolts are those two there. They're countersunk heads. Yeah. And you tighten them up on the back. See? That's what he means by staked. Yeah? yeah. So they can't come undone. He's obviously worried about he's tightening them up, tightening them up, tightening them up till it works. Or he's turned these, tightening them up till it works. It's hard to know, but um I mean, they haven't got to be frantically tight as long as they're done up you know fairly well i'd say it'll be okay but if you are worried about it strip it down again and where your tripper bolt goes through i can't remember how exactly how they work it must be shouldered right they just sit in a countersunk recess if that countersunk recess is worn out you could use a washer They're countersunk spring washers. Now that will raise it. What's that? Not even a 30 second of an inch. That's, that's a tiny amount by the time it's done up. But that will bring your countersunk side up just that little bit. Yeah. And that will probably let the ratchet go in properly. And then you can, um, it should work. Ideally, what you want is a cup washer like that, but without the serrations, because you, you, your thing's going to catch on it. Uh -huh. um, but that's the only other way you'll do it, is just bring that up slightly before you do them up tight. More gearbox questions. <laughs> the dreaded Harley gearbox. Yeah. Uh, where did you get all the standard spec values that you were calling out? Can you tell the all source? Uh, what Harley-Davidson manual or other manual? Well, I think obviously we've gone through the manuals, but... Um Again, the book. Again, that's the one that's got the diagram with all of the washer thicknesses and everything. That one tells you how to set it all up. All your spacings in the gears when they're back in, what end floats you got, everything. So that's your book. Again, like I said before, those three Harley books, you'll pretty much rebuild the whole bike. There's a few quirky things on them, but nothing major because they were written for squaddies, basically. So, if a customer gives us a bike to restore, does that mean like it's a guaranteed trouble-free riding for a few years? I mean, you give the bike back, what could go wrong? Um, they're old motorbikes. Um, <sighs> carbs go out of tune on them. Um, you can fiddle around them. The timing can slip. Um, Generally, they're they're pretty good, but what you got to remember is during a war, Rodney, these things were serviced regularly, you know. And if something broke, they just threw it away and put a new one on. What about the trouble of buying buying new old stock parts. New old stock's okay, generally. Repo parts. You never know what you're getting. Yes, it's a much cheaper option. Um, things can go wrong. But if someone brings a bike to a place like here or any any place that has work done on it yeah does that give you any guarantee that it's going to no it doesn't give you a guarantee and obviously you have to deal with it within reason with the situation that arises yeah you know um yeah it's just it's the nature of the beast they're old old vehicles you know but it's looking a bit cramped just just a tad yes what, yeah. can you explain what's currently going on well we're moving units to two down which has got a ramp in it, which will save my body immensely because I'm getting old and it hurts. <laughs> so, got a ramp in there. I've had all the lighting done in there. We're just having the flooring done today. So then everything that's in here, I've just got to sort through, work out exactly what I want to keep, what I want to throw away, and then start moving into the other unit, which will all be good. I'll be able to see and yeah. I won't have to roll around on the floor all day. Shall we go and have a look then? Yeah. 